think we got an email uh, that was inquiring, either inquiring whether we'd be interested or identifying that we would be on a list but we had to submit back. It was all very mysterious and unbelievable. And I think it was only through communication um, with someone else who had more intimate knowledge with what was going on, I think with uh, uh, Herzog and Demeron specifically, that indeed we found out it was real. Um, but I don't think we ever, uh, we, we were certainly ser uh, concerned about the kind of scale of the project and concerned about the, the time frame being incredibly quick, but I think our enthusiasm for being able to be part of what was really an exceptional process of 100 architects working simultaneously on a similar project um, certainly over, uh, outweighed any of our kind of anxieties about the project. So once we found out that the project was actually legitimate, I think our, um, I don't think we ever had any kind of um, moments of kind of questioning whether we were going to do it or not. We were somewhat aware of Ai Weiwei's work. I mean, only in the work that he had done as an architect, uh, some reputation particularly, I think it was the work he had done in relation to Kazel. But it, part of this is clearly an, or, or an attempt to try to organize and corral um, cat herd, as it were, under architects. Uh, and so the very process itself is uh, what, makes, what makes the project interesting. And I think he took it on as a challenge. It's not out of context with the nature of the work that he's already done. Particularly, I think it was uh, getting a 1,001 uh, Chinese natives to be able to go to so, but other than that, his own work, I think, has some influence on the designers, given the fact that uh, within Wardos itself, because it's one of the few buildings that are, that's there, uh, that gives you a sense of what can be built, or what are the lo logistics of being built. So I think that's probably more of an influence on the overall piece than necessarily the reputation that he had, uh, this direct influence through the material conditions of the project that's already in, in play and in place. I think in one sense the client was actually quite real and definitive in the sense that um, that Mr. Sai, Ai Weiwei, and Fake Design were in a certain sense our direct client. And it, it was in a way the end user who was more abstract and in a way we had to kind of project a bit for. However, um, I think it's also kind of can be uh, presumptive to assume, say, a specific identity for that user. I think there are many instances in architecture, if you're designing a hotel, if you're designing a restaurant, if you're designing an institutional building, where the specific identity of the end user is more generic or more general um, and kind of uh, abstract in a sense. Um, and in that way, it was not that distinct from the approach that we would take in those instances. And I think there were certain logics of kind of domestic existence in life that we um, that we apply to that from obviously kind of direct experiences, architects, etc. Um, and then I, th I think that we were also wary about, you know, on one hand our role as Westerners building in Mongolia, um, uh, both in the sense of maybe taking for granted certain suppositions about Western domesticity, but I think also in terms of maybe being overly paternalistic or potentially kind of presumptive about somehow assuming a, a kind of authentic kind of Chinese inhabitant of the spaces. I think that's a, it's a good question because it's, it's something that uh, we know, given the structure of the project is such that we are to design through essentially a design development, that the translation into the final construction documents, ultimately the oversight of the project, which we typically do and take great pride and, and care in doing, we, knew we weren't going to be able to be doing that. So it's not necessarily specific to Chinese construction, but simply the structure of the project itself which meant that we had to design a project that had a clarity at the level of diagram and a kind of solidity and robustness of the material choices that you wouldn't necessarily rely upon a kind of obsessive or fetishized finish because there's no necess necessity that the project would be translated that way. Um, so in part, it's less a question, I would say, of Chinese construction techniques than the very structure of the project and the translation that's inevitably going to be occurring between a design development to CDs to site in what we know is going to be a pretty fast-paced construction schedule. Um, so because in, it's one of the things that going to Beijing and going to Mongolia, there are some pretty spectacular projects being built. So it's not necessarily such that the Chinese construction is always 
is, is a pejorative. It's actually the nature of the structure of building, also building in Inner Mongolia, where the availability of skills, particular to masonry, is there, but more wood and more detailed craft skills that we tend to think are associated with construction of more timber-based building tends to not be there simply because of availability of materials. I think, on the one hand, there is this kind of very clear, you know, almost sort of surrealist sort of division between uh, sort of highly uh, sort of contained and defined volumetric um, volume, and then a series of sort of externalized walls, which begin to kind of make these explicit ties between the interior and exterior spaces, and begin to kind of define a series of exterior rooms within the landscape. Um, on the other hand, within the kind of logic of the ground floor itself, which Paul was describing as existing of these courtyard walls, which move from interior to exterior, um, there's another kind of contradiction or sort of paradox embodied, which is somehow negotiating between uh, the fact that this house exists within this fairly dense organization where there are very kind of robust architectures existing at all sides of this thing um, and uh, and the kind of larger development sort of urbanistic logic of Ordos um, and trying to find a way that on the one hand the house has very strong connections to the exterior um, and you have this incredibly kind of dramatic um, uh, sort of landscape at Ordos which is you know a sort of extension of, of the desert with these incredibly blue skies and these sort of intense uh, temperature differences um, and so how could we begin to kind of connect the house to the outside but in ways that didn't necessarily presume uh, maybe a, a kind of uh, a sort of pure landscape that um, we didn't in fact have control of here right so um, given that in a way our territory of control existed within a fairly constrained plot of land um, that somewhat sort of the, the internalized notion of these these courtyards came as a kind of response to somehow being both introverted and extroverted at the same time right and we actually that kind of interesting quality of both inside outside both more privatized and secure at the same time as having this more direct um, contact with the exterior, um, I think, is, is, is already a kind of uh, a sort of duplicity or a kind of interesting um, uh, aspect at play within that kind of ground plan itself. I, I, I think, in, in answer to that, it's really been, from our standpoint, a pretty interesting project to be involved in. Um, at one level, it's designing with these interesting paradoxes that we've been discussing. Um, but for me, one of the most fascinating things is given the kind of uh, idealized condition of 100 architects that did the exact same program, the only variable is the site. How do you actually, what comes out of that? And what comes out of it is not only the formal differences and the ability to see a wide, wide spectrum of approaches, but also the interaction that occurred within Ordos, which was pretty unusual to have. Um, over 100 architects, sometimes two, if not three people from firms, in a kind of sequestered condition for five to seven days to have a conversation with people you would never have a chance to meet. And I think it's that impact uh, beyond the simply the, the, the building of the project itself, uh, assuming it goes through, it's going to have, I think, pretty lasting impacts in terms of the combinations, of connections, and networks that we made. One of the things that's certainly fascinating is the is the, the taxonomy that's present, right? Uh, as David mentioned, with the exception of the slight variation in sight, everyone essentially was on the same, uh, given the, had all these same restrictions and, and parameters from time to cost to budget to client, right? So in a sense, you get this. Um, what we refer to as kind of an architectural petting zoo of the entire place. Um, that certainly it, it has its own interest, right? From just sheer kind of cross-section of how would people design within these kind of parameters. And given the, the fact that there were such regulatory um, kind of organi organizing principles, one can really then say, well, what are the variations that are coming out from the standpoint of design? It's not about this client having this pressure, this budget being, so you can't compare this house to this house. Like you, it, it's very hard to compare to um, houses because they might have very different kind of pressures on them. The, all these houses have the exact same pressures on them. So that's a kind of fascinating uh, kind of uh, uh, condition. The other aspect of that, which I think goes to a much more interesting question, is that the mere fact that architectural design is now being the kind of public spectacle of that place, in effect, has eliminated the gated community. In a sense, you've got architectural design making the public, giving it a public uh, agency or public um, 
uh, ambition, probably be the best way to put it, um, or public purpose, so that th in a sense, the very presence of the design is, is actually helping to mitigate and remove the very things that we often associate and are being built in China around these exact same complexes. So it's an interesting case where it's not the, just that you get design, but you also, in the act of getting the design, there's the removal of the gated communities, the pedestrian walkways. It's accessible to anybody to walk, walk through, precisely because that's the feature that makes it interesting. So that, that I think, is a really kind of interesting kind of a, 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 an interesting kind of twist where here architecture design is actually replacing the security devices associated with these compounds. In some ways you'd almost want, to, I'd like to be able to say yes, but unfortunately it hasn't happened to the extent uh, in the sense of having a hundred architects from around the world to do it. Although the very nature of the project, which is to have a number of very large houses in a collective area, is the norm, is in fact uh, completely the norm. So it's based upon a kind of suburban model, but in that case, you have very large houses that tend to be all the same image drawn from a series of catalogs designed by architects, but architects are usually left to be anonymous hidden behind the nature of the plans that are being sold and purchased by the contractor or developer. Um, in some ways, you, it would be great if there were more uh, projects similar to this where you would have agencies recognizing that for relatively, for the budgets that were given, the, the fees that were given, you could produce some pretty spectacular uses of land that would be, in fact, a much better way to use the land than the current suburban development. So obviously looking much more closely at the size of the houses, scaling them down to about 2,000 square feet, looking at a much more ecological relationship to the overall land patterns as part of the site plan. But if you could, all of a sudden you begin to foreground the issues that Paul has raised to the value of architecture to recast the relationship of public and publicness within typically privatized developments. And I think at some level that, that folds into some of the earlier questions and these notions of kind of repetition, scale, and how the kind of organizational kind of logic of Ordos is really based on a, a kind of notion of a kind of repetitive meaning that gets played out at this kind of um, fairly massive kind of urbanistic scale. Um, at one level, the, the role of the architect here, one could argue, is actually kind of greater than it might, you might find it in, say, um, corresponding or kind of analogous developments, say, in the United States, where, you know, housing is designed generally without any kind of um, sort of attention design and this scale of development might actually get played out with the exact same generic unit being kind of repeated from site to site. Um, so at a kind of very, very basic level, um, and putting aside some of these questions of the scale of the individual house, right, um, that we've been talking about, and which could um, sort of be questioned, um, the notion of the, the architect as a kind of, having a kind of role, a kind of value to add um, to the, the kind of overall kind of dialogue, um, both relative to each house and each kind of individual house design, but also then thinking about the relationship between each house and its kind of adjacent houses. Um, I think, in a way, it's probably greater in a context like Ordos than it would be in a kind of equivalent, say, generic kind of suburban development here in the United States. It's very hard to describe the dream client or the dream project because the moment you start generalizing, you undermine the specificity of, of, of what makes a project challenging and therefore more interesting. Um, I, I certainly hold to the position that the thing that you think is going to be the dream is often going to be your worst nightmare. Um, that the, the project with a client that says do whatever you want and here's an unlimited budget usually ends up being a terrible project because there's no resistance and there's no get back and there's no parameters by which the game is played. Um, so in some ways, the every project is, is conditioned or qualified and that qualification, actually, if it's seen in the right way, is in fact the very thing that catalyzes the best projects, whether or not it lays out the most elegant or seamless or um, happy circumstances for design is a whole other question.